Hello, and thank you for joining. In this presentation, I want to take some time to introduce Amitek Crank and our storyboard technology. We will be seeing how Storyboard makes it possible to rapidly create great performing UIs for embedded products using MCUs, whilst maximizing the flexibility in sourcing and their system design. I hope to show you how Storyboard can help your business get to market faster in these challenging times by leveraging our novel development approaches and workflow optimizations. First, an introduction. My name is Gary Clarkson. I'm a field application engineer for Amatec Crank. I'm based in the UK. And my role is to help our customers across Europe, into Asia and uh, into Africa uh, with their product development uh, and their integration with Storyboard. So looking at uh, the agenda today, the approach that we take and our system architecture is a little different to traditional techniques. And we do this for some good reasons, uh, and I'll hopefully explain why and how we do this. As we go, I will walk you through some of the design considerations for developing GUIs for embedded devices in particular, and step through the core stages of their development. We will look at how an embedded product solution that may previously have been conceived for uh, perhaps an application class processor could also be replatformed and deployed onto an MCU without loss of user experience, UX, or UI performance and fidelity. With the challenges in the semiconductor supply chain hitting the whole industry, the flexibility that Storyboard technology offers in decoupling the UI from the processor gives you choices to remove roadblocks for your next generation product development. If you haven't heard of Amitech Crank before this presentation, I guarantee you've probably used a product running an HMI that was built using our GUI development software storyboard. Our technology was uh, created to help make GUI development more efficient for embedded platforms. And when you look at traditional markets like medical, automotive, uh, industrial, or even consumer markets like white goods, IoT, and wearables, they all share common challenges when looking to deliver an excellent user interface on the device's LCD screen. So the founders of Crank set out to build a solution that could help remove the inefficiencies of the workflow that frustrated them and their developer colleagues when it came to building GUI applications. So both on over two decades of experience in designing and implementing GUI solutions in a broad range of industries. Storyboard was designed to remove some of the barriers that are traditionally associated with uh, embedded GUI design. Storyboard has tools and features that ease the development challenges and design challenges across the whole development lifecycle, from initial artwork design, import, uh, to re-import through refinement using desktop and simulation and testing. So we use a hardware agnostic runtime framework, and this uses a model view controller approach and this enables us to provide whole application tools, for example, to apply initialization and translations, or perhaps uh, handle embedded SKU management with resizing and reskinning uh, for rebranding and different sizes of uh, screens. So Storyboard was designed, uh, purpose-built for collaboration around the user experience. And we specifically designed it to give features for developers and designers to iterate easily. And the, the balance really is to, to get the right people doing the right part of the development. So it's a low code or no code GUI development framework um, that really has a low barrier to entry for software development and for designers. So there is a distinct separation of design and code environments. The front end design is decoupled from the back end logic, uh, and this enables developers and designers to update and test the app at the same time and in parallel. So the rapid design and re-import technology, um, we can import or update PSD or sketch files and actions or events which were previously established and attached to, to the uh, UI elements are carried forward. So as long as you keep the naming standards the same between the two versions of the design, you can import and re-import to a uh, new branding. As part of this, there is a graphical comparison tool you can remain in control of which elements are brought in and uh, which are, uh, are left. 
And this really is the, the equivalent of a code diff uh, if you're looking at software. So with all of this and the fact that we're able to give platform and OS independent, um, we're able to design GUIs and de deploy them on multiple different platforms without doing a lot of re-engineering. So our runtimes are, are built specifically uh, for each target platform and they're optimized for performance and any hardware features that are available. So we're really able to get the best out of your application hardware. Let's now take a close look at the application and system design aspects of developing a storyboard GUI. When beginning a new design, there are some key considerations and our storyboard technology gives you some freedom to create your next product UI uh, without locking in the target platform. So you're able to design your MPU or MCU based GUI planning your product's future roadmap. So the handling of some of those images, uh, encoding and display and the way they are overlaid or moved uh, has a bearing on the choice of hardware. Importing and managing the GUI aspects. So this is, uh, these are the assets such as the images um, and other, other objects. These have to be brought in from somewhere. So how are you going to start your design? Uh, what features and capabilities and indeed what mix of team resources you have? So what XPCs do you have in house? And the way that you take those assets and apply layering and transparency and pixel level or global alpha blending and things like this have a big bearing on the, the CPU loading and the, uh, the fluidness of the, the UI. So all of these taken into uh, consideration. You need to really start thinking about the UI as early in the development process as you can. So you can use Storyboard to take a UI design from concept to functional prototype in our development simulation environment. This gives you a really great way to test out the, the scope and the range of the UI uh, to achieve the user experience you're looking for. Uh, and to look at the way that the UI with its text, the image assets are presented, how they interact, and how they move and respond to user input. And this can all be done without fixing on a particular target application hardware. So the sizing and optimal use of memory uh, is a key consideration. So this is a flash NSD RAM. So you need to choose your hardware and your target platform based on the size of the assets you're gonna be using. So let's look at that in a bit more detail. Stepping back, uh, the core features of your system design are going to be CPU core. So Storyboard is designed to be very lightweight and efficient uh, and our runtime libraries are optimized for uh, different MPU cores from uh, Cortex M33 for example, M4 and M7, Cortex M class devices, all the way up to multi-core uh, processors with GPUs and these are typically Cortex A class application processors. So when you're looking at uh, some of these, some of these applications, even down into the MCU space now, have graphics acceleration. So we're able to support either basic software only render, um, but on some platforms, if available, we can take, a, take a advantage of 2D and 3D hardware acceleration. This gives you higher performance and offloads some of the CPU loading. So things like PXP, uh, VGLite, OpenVG and OpenGL libraries uh, come into play here. Memory, memory uh, is is a big is a big consideration. Uh, it's key that you've got not only enough memory but also the right mix of memory. So this is fast internal uh, SRAM for really high performance operations, um, or slower external uh, memory for perhaps things that uh, are uh, you know buffers or LCD frames. So. Storyboard does require some form of RTOS, even a basic RTOS. Um, the HMI, by definition, is asynchronous to any other system operation functions. So thinking of the way that your, your UI operates in addition to the control logic or control data, data acquisition that you're doing in your system. So this is going to this is going to leverage uh, even just basic um, operating system functionality, such as tasks. Uh, queues, timers, synchronization objects, and memory management. So we can run on pretty much any RTOS or high level operating system as long as those core functionality objects are available. 
So what I want to draw your attention to um, is a great white paper, um, choosing the correct hardware platform for GUI applications. So this is available on our website uh, and we're also, there's a link on the page there. Memory, so this is the, one of the most popular questions that we get asked. So how much memory does Storyboard need? So the Storyboard engine needs some working memory, which holds the model uh, metadata and other core buffers for variables and screen objects, for example. And we generally recommend this is a minimum of around 100 kilobytes. There is an additional static allocation required, and this is often the largest consumer of RAM resources. This is the uh, graphics pixel frame buffer or buffers. So you can see, actually, it's a fairly simple calculation. Um, with embedded GUIs, it's not about screen size, it's about screen resolution pixels. So each pixel requires some memory. And the calculation is very straightforward. So for a, uh, a screen such as a 480 by 272 display, which is common on many MCU uh, development boards, um, you, can, you can look at a, a scenario where you've got four bytes per pixel, 32 bit color depth, uh, ARGB8888. So the pixels wide times high times number of bytes per pixels, and that comes out at 510 kilobytes per frame buffer. So this is a, the physical memory uh, to hold the pixels that we draw and composite. If acceptable or if possible, you can reduce this by dropping to a 16 bit color format. So this is RGB. 565 so 16 bits two bytes per pixel that comes down to 255 kilobytes additionally on most systems uh, we recommend uh, double buffering so this is where the one frame buffer is used by the uh, the render engine so storyboard's main render engine task and this is where we're doing the drawing operations the compositing the read write access and the second buffer is used for the refresh of the LCD, for example. So the LCD is looking at one buffer while we're drawing to the second. And when the frame is complete, we flip the memory interface. So that allows you to, uh, to avoid tearing and other graphics um, yeah, drawing artifacts. So we don't support 8-bit palette mode at present. 8-bit uh, palette mode is a color gamut of 256 discrete colors. Uh, pulled from that uh, 16 or 32 bit color space. The reason for this uh, is in our experiments, this really compromises display fidelity and quality. So consider the case where you've got gradient fills and edge effects, uh, such as anti-aliasing around fonts and other things. The quality and the, the fidelity of the UI drops when you drop to 8 bit. So this is a, a last resort really. So um, a bit about the frame buffer. So frame buffers are, uh, are required to be a continuous block of memory, a contiguous. This is a linear stretch of uh, memory from the same memory region, and it's required for our render engine to do pixel operations. So rendering algorithms are memory intensive and require lots of read, modify, write operations. So this is where fast RAM access times and caching are important for best performance. The internal on-chip memory, the SRAM on the physical device, are often much faster than perhaps external SDRAM. Uh, and this is because it requires transfer over the external shared memory bus. This is usually a precious resource. So on some architectures, uh, they have GPU cores, uh, or 2D or 3D cores. And these subsystems may have their own working memory requirements. So you need to factor this in as well. So typically this might be a heap for handling uh, graphic surfaces or textures. And this is an independent of storyboard. It's another static allocation. So in terms of the application, when you're developing it, the, uh, there are some graphical effects such as complex screen transitions, uh, drawing off screen using canvases, or, or even the uh, image decompression and manipulation uh, all require buffers. Uh, and this can increase the, uh, the amount of dynamic memory you use during the application. So in summary, uh, the uh, blending um, and the, the fast internal SRAM and external SDRAM operations uh, can have a, uh, an impact on the system architecture. It's, it's, so it's, uh, it's optimal to get the right blend there. I should say that um, I know I mentioned two graphical frame buffers uh, on some, some systems, uh, perhaps with a, uh, an external SPI based um, LCD. 
These have on-chip, uh, on-glass memory. So in this case, we don't need two buffers. You can get away with one. So so on some, uh, some of the smaller MCU target platforms with a, a, a perhaps a 240 by 320 SPI based uh, interface, you can leverage the, uh, the, the frame buffer on the, on the device and only have one frame buffer. Storage. Obviously your application needs to be stored somewhere and this is in non-volatile memory. So this is typically flash, uh, although you can stage things on external removable memory such as SD cards or SDMMC. So when you're looking at this, the uh, the core engine library, so the core of Storyboard, adds um, around 500 to 800 kilobytes of program memory. This is executable code in our libraries. Uh, and these are provided as uh, pre-built static libraries. Uh, and the, the architecture of Storyboard is very um, compartmentalized uh, and we use a plugin architecture. So many uh, system elements, as many effects and many uh, core graphical objects are wrapped in individual plugins. And if you're not using those plugins, you don't have to deploy them. So you're able to tune and, and remove and minimize the footprint of the, uh, the application code there. Obviously, the graphical application itself uh, has uh, some resources. So there's the application model, uh, the, the gap file, the GDE model, as well as fixed assets such as images, fonts, uh, perhaps scripts. Uh, and the size and complexity of these defines the amount of memory you're going, to, you're going to use. So you can split and store the assets from the executive code um, to minimize the bill of materials and processor selection. For example, executable code is best stored in fast access flash. And this is uh, close to the, uh, the, the processor. It may be QSPY. Graphical resources can be split out and stored in, in slower off chip memory. So not using the, the, uh, the, the precious on chip resources, but you can move these to, uh, to perhaps off, off chip QSPY or OSPY devices. And these are bulk devices and these are often much cheaper. Um, than using a much higher uh, flash spaced processor in the first place. So Storyboard can be configured very flexibly. We can run with a file system such as FlatFS or, or indeed without using our proprietary um, Storyboard virtual file system technology, so SBVFS. Um, or indeed both, you can, hand, you can blend between the two. So we're looking at the amount of space you need. Um, we've got some tools, the, uh, the storyboard resource metrics and the export configuration allow you to profile and tune the memory footprint. So this is the step to export the platform resources. So you can tune uh, and you can configure and you can modify the way in which resources are stored, for example. Um, so you can blend their RAM versus flash requirements. So storing things uncompressed in uh, flash means that you don't then need SRAM buffers to decrypt them or de, de, uh, in, well, inflate them. And for example, fonts, uh, we have a font editor. So fonts you can uh, store not only as dynamic, uh, so rendered on the fly, which requires, again, some system RAM. Um, you can actually store them as bitmaps, so they're just treated as images. And you can even, with our font editor, you can uh, go in and pull out just the glyphs in those fonts which are used by the application so you don't need the whole font set uh, you can just reduce it to the font glyphs that you require so this is very powerful and this gives you very fine control of your uh, system memory footprint and the way it's optimized for a different platform so the architecture of storyboard is very simple uh, and very flexible Storyboard uses a model view controller design pattern, which means that our tools generate a model and resources which execute on a runtime platform, a runtime engine, which we provide pre-built as binary libraries, uh, along with some tools that are optimized for each target platform and the graphical environment, uh, be that uh, software render or uh, GPU accelerated. Our target runtime platforms also ship with a Lua runtime plugin. Uh, Lua is a language, it's very lightweight, and you may have come across this in your, uh, in your gaming uh, history. Uh, so this uh, Lua plugin uh, enables you to add scripts. Uh, these are interpreted and not cross-compiled. 
uh, to control and drive the UI programmatically if you need. Uh, and this is for combinational logic or sequential logic. Uh, and this is using our powerful Lua API extensions to the, uh, the standard Lua code. So we don't generate C or C++ code, which means that you don't need to cross compile and build each time you make a change. So simply make the changes and test them locally on your PC for the application and then hit deploy in storyboard and the files are, are simply exported to the target. This makes it very simple, fast and efficient for both designers and developers to build UIs. And also it encourages uh, rapid design iteration. This is making changes, testing them, deploying them. So a little bit more about the uh, high level application architecture. The front end is our graphical engine and the runtime components which run your application model to handle all of the UI and UX tasks. Uh, this presents the display uh, and the information to the user and passes back control input, such as buttons or touchscreen presses. The back end is where your application procedural state machine code is running. And this is whatever tasks and hardware control that make your device do what it does. The communication mechanism between the two is called Storyboard IO. And this sits between the front end storyboard app UI and your back end code. And it's in the form of queues in both directions. We call them channels, which pass events uh, optionally with data and a payload backwards and forwards. And so this is the exchange of control input and output. Storyboard IO itself has a very simple API. Uh, it's channel open, serialize, write, read, unserialize and close, which provides a a simple API for your application code, and it's a single static library that you link with your backend code in your compiler and toolchain. On a high level operating system such as Windows or Linux, storyboard models and graphical assets are simply exported as file resources to be used in the target file system. And these can be deployed using SCP network file copy or simply copied via an SD card or USB stick. The front end, which is a SB engine host process, and your back end are discrete system processes, PIDs in the application system. So the storyboard uses an inter-process systems communication, an IPC mechanism between them and it uses standard transport protocols depending on the platform. For example, on Linux, this is a System V, a SysV message queue. Uh, or optionally, you can use a TCP IP socket transport, which could be on the same machine, or perhaps to, uh, to uh, across a network between your developer PC and your target. So this allows you to test headless, for example. Uh, and to wrap it up, a simple launcher script is all you need to set up the runtime paths and startup options for the SB engine as well as the model file to run. Now on an RTOS, this is ostensibly the, exactly the same event architecture, but it can use a much simpler uh, lighter weight API with a local queue uh, between your state machine control code and main tasks. These are tasks running in the same memory space, so we don't need to be into process. The graphical assets in this case can be deployed to a file system such as FATFS, or more usually, um, this is commonly not included as a, an MCU target. So uh, you'll, you'll be using a flash-based uh, implementation using our storyboard virtual file system. And this is, uh, this is a structure which lays out those assets in, uh, in a header file format. And you export this uh, as, as a header from the storyboard designer. So looking a bit further at uh, the integration for MCU platforms uh, and a, a given RTOS, it's actually very simple. So Storyboard is middleware and it sits on top of your existing RTOS and BSP code, as well as your platform drivers. Uh, and you are free to modify all this, it's all your code. So Storyboard can use any RTOS uh, you like really, and it leverages the same core components and core functionality. These are tasks, queues, timers, synchronization objects, and memory management. So we provide the storyboard run kind components and plugins a set of static libraries, .a files for MCUs, that you simply link with your RTOS uh, application code. In terms of integration, storyboard requires adding a single task for the graphical engine. This is the SB Engine main task, or perhaps a second one if you have user input, this is SB Engine input. 
Uh, and this is where you've got touch or keyboard input, uh, for example, in addition to your existing control tasks. Uh, we provide a template implementation uh, in uh, sbengine-task.c, which can be customized for your hardware requirements, uh, as well as a, a second file, sbengine-plugins.h, which lists uh, the optional plugin components, which will be loaded and used by your model. The model itself, uh, along with all of the assets, the graphical resources, images, fonts, and scripts, etc., is exported to uh, Storyboard System Designer in the form of the resource header file. This is sbengine-model.h, and basically it contains all of those assets, um, which have been hex encoded as structures. And this gets uh, compiled and linked along with your application code. So looking further. Um, Within the integration code we provide, there are usually just three functions that you have to align with or perhaps adjust to your hardware specifics. And so it's all actually very straightforward. So you're free to customize these. Um, the first one is the run storyboard app. And this function is the effective that a launcher, where on Linux, this was a, a launcher script. This is a function. Um, and it, and, and it triggers the loading of the plugins and also the model from uh, flash or storage and then kicks off the storyboard engine. The second one is the generic display in it. This is a callback function from the storyboard engine, uh, from the core of the storyboard engine back into your application code. It is called exactly once. And this is immediately after the internal storyboard engine initialization has completed. And this is where you would typically configure uh, the display hardware, like the LCD interface you're using, um, and also obvious things like turning the backlight on for, for the GPIO. You also allocate a number of frame buffers and then align these addresses and the color space formats um, to the display surface dimensions for the storyboard render operations. So this is a, a one-time configuration. And if you have a, a two or three D GPU present, you would also configure and initialize this. And the third one is a generic display update. This is uh, the second key callback function from the Storyboard Engine core. Uh, and it's called each and every time Storyboard has rendered a complete new frame. Note that Storyboard is a demand-based render engine technology. So we will only trigger a display update if something has caused the visual content in the frame to be displayed uh, and changed. It is not called every 60 frames per second. So it's only when uh, something has triggered a display of visible change. An information structure is passed in by the render engine, which specifies the frame buffer address as well as the damaged rectangle region. This is metadata that was uh, that. Uh, was defined when we updated the frame uh, and it, it, lo it locates the area or the region of that frame buffer which was updated as part of that last frame update. So you can then use this information to invoke whatever driver calls are needed to update the physical display interface and LCD content. Um, and this is taken from the pixel data provided in the frame buffer that we've just rendered. On most systems with a double buffering technique, uh, this can be as simple as flipping the LCD interface buffer pointer to refresh from the new frame buffer we've just provided. Uh, perhaps on some smaller MCU systems with display hardware such as uh, SPI based panels, which have uh, onboard display RAM uh, and a relatively slow serial interface, you can leverage uh, a single frame buffer and the onboard display RAM with the damaged rectangle metadata to reduce not only the amount of system memory needed, uh, but also the bandwidth of the display interface. Uh, and this can often be done with a, a partial screen update API function call that, uh, that many of these displays support. So looking at the second input task, um, this uh, is optional, you don't have to have one, but uh, where a system has a touchscreen or, or hard keys or other physical user input, such as a rotary encoder, then a second task is often used. Again, this should be handled and processed totally asynchronously to your main storyboard process. Um, this is so that you can be as responsive and uh, you need uh, and not introduce any input lag. So we don't want to be waiting around for something to complete before we actually provide the input. It simply polls or processes the input hardware and uh, calling whatever BSP drivers or IO functions are necessary and then maps these 
to standard storyboard events. So uh, GRE.press, release or motion for touch events. Uh, maybe for hard keys, this might be a GRE key down or key up. Uh, and these would be uh, passing in a key code, for example, which emulates a standard keyboard and allows you to simulate and test it on a desktop. The uh, GR application send event function here is used to post these events to the storyboard engine main task. Uh, and this is used as a queue for them to be handled and executed asynchronously by the model. Uh, and this will trigger any actions associated in the model and display uh, process update. So you can extend this function, you can manage this in any way or shape you need. So the integration is really pretty straightforward and simple, and most of the code is totally standard and in your control. Now let's take a look at storyboard in action. So I'm going to show you some scenarios. The uh, first scenario I'm going to talk you through is um, perhaps Deploying to a, a Linux uh, microprocessor environment, this will be a Cortex-A class, um, and I've got an example on my desk here. So the first of all, uh, what we need to do is create the application in the first place. So uh, there are many ways to do this. One of them, for example, is using our Photoshop import capability. So I'm not going to go through the whole cycle here, um, but what I can show you on the screen is uh, there's a uh, full screens in our coffee app, sample app, uh, and this is something we we ship with most of our dev boards as a, as a simple example of, of applications. And you can see, um, you can see we've got the concept of layers here and I can turn the layers on and off and uh, basically it's a layer stack up. Okay, so um, what we've done, we've imported that into Storyboard. So I'll bring up Storyboard here. So you can see the application, the GDE file is, is my model. And I'm looking at the model view here. You can see each of those screens has been recreated uh, and we've, actually got all of the assets and uh, and files and images brought into the project. So these are being split out. Okay. So also included are a bunch of actions. So you can see here that on some of the uh, the items like the close button, um, we've got some Lua script and Lua script triggers some, some custom behavior. If I go to that now, you can see some, some Lua. Um, so this is a combinational logic. This does the dynamic behavior that we were talking about. Okay, so um, in addition to that, we've got some animations and things. Um, I'll, I'll show you in action and you can see what it looks like. Okay, so let me kick off that. And this is running on the Windows 32 x86 um, OpenGL version of our runtime, which is on my desktop. So you can see a bit of a fade effect, some transition movement there. I'm going to click through the screens quickly. Okay, so this is uh, this is running in a, in a Linux environment or Windows environment here. Um, and this is a process... Uh, running independently, and this is using local Lua script. Okay, so let's look at that uh, in terms of the application. So we have what we call the resource view. Um, let me pull that up uh, in terms of uh, a, a custom configuration. Okay, so here we have our application. I'm going to export that as a gap file. Gap file is our uh, generic application, a graphical application file. Uh, in this case, I'm going to use a transfer file transfer using SCP over the network. Uh, the board I have here is actually a Calibri, um, a, a Toradex Calibri IMXX ULL board. So this is a non-hardware accelerated. Um, and I'm going to be deploying it using the network link. So I've got an SSH connection uh, and it's going to download it to this folder and uh, execute this launcher script to run it. OK, so um, what we need to look at is maybe the resource uh, footprint first before we do this. So I can see here that we're going to be looking at seven megs of, uh, of RAM used. And in terms of file system space, again, this is excluding the, the, um, the runtime uh, libraries itself. So this is just the application resources. Uh, you can see each of these images are, are there. Um, you know, the background image is quite interesting, for example. So the coffee background, those beans, um, when you show it in memory, it's, in, it's inflated, 1.46 meg. On disk, it's compressed and it's 803 kilobytes. Uh, and if you saw before, the application is sized for 800 by 480. So these are quite large images. OK, so um, what I can do is go and deploy that now. Uh, if I switch to hopefully split screen, what you should be able to see is uh, my board um, running. Uh, let me go for this one. My board's running our standard kind of uh, attractive launcher demo that we use uh, when we're at exhibitions. OK, so um, hopefully if I move this over here, I'm going to hit deploy and you should see the screen change as I've deployed and run my application. Uh, in the corner here, you can see uh, we've got some progress indicator. Um, I'm downloading the files, those assets 
that's now deployed to the target and you can see on the board that that's running and I can touch the touch screen. Okay, so that's an example of uh, building and deploying an application for a Linux target. And this is usually using uh, the processor deployment uh, and the file system. Uh, and if I switch just for a final confirmation, you can see here that um, this is my target board. This is uh, a utility called WinSCP. Uh, and we're using the Linux Yocto version of our runtime. And here's all the bunch of plugins and such. So this is my local file file folders and, and when I look on the target we've got the same there so I've got a few versions side by side the application itself if I refresh it uh, we've just deployed this coffee app new and here's all my scripts and assets so this is literally a file copy so that's uh, that's using a file system based deployment on a high level operating system this next scenario shows storyboard being used with a storyboard for MCUs so Essentially, the uh, development process is exactly the same. The deployment method is slightly different. So let me show you that. Back in Storyboard, uh, we're going to close off our, uh, MC, our uh, MPU version, the 800 by 480 version. So we're going to close that one down. Uh, what we've done, we've used uh, our resize method. Uh, I'm going to open that project. So when you view an application a model, in storyboard. The top level of the model gives you uh, some detailed information. So it's 480 by 272 resolution. And we have a resize engine. So uh, we, we could have gone and in fact we did. Uh, we resized it uh, from the 800 by 480 to uh, 480 by 272. And this is the, 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 the size of the screen are common on 4.3 inch uh, touch screens that are on many of the uh, development boards. Okay, so so we got to that, that stage and uh, what you should see when I run this is the application is exactly the same as it was before. Um, however, it's somewhat smaller, so the resolution has shrunk, okay? But in terms of functionality, everything is exactly the same, okay? So the first thing we notice uh, is that uh, we need to um, consider the footprint. So uh, we'll go and look at the uh, application export options. So for the storyboard for MCU, uh, this is a storyboard light configuration. Storyboard for MCU um, doesn't use the uh, the uh, gap file export we looked at before. This time it uses a C or C++ header. So we're going to be exporting our assets in the form of a model header, sbengine model.h. And this is going to be added to our project. So we can take a look at the resource footprint now. Um, in its default form, uh, you can see that uh, obviously the the sizes of the image are slightly smaller, but uh, we're still looking at um, you know a reasonable size of, uh, of footprint. So we're predicting 2.8 megabytes and 1.14 megabytes. So on many uh, many target boards, this is perfectly fine. There's uh, there's MCUs with SD RAM, and we can deploy this as we had before. Um, what we can do, however, is uh, make some optimizations. So what I can do. Um, initially is we'll take um, we'll take a view that all these images instead of storing them in their compressed form to take less flash space note the 1.14 megs of flash we can store them in a native what we call the um, that's native format is compressed it will will for, store it in what we call direct format so I'll choose RGB 565 so this is a 16-bit format so immediately you can see the drop in uh, drop in SRAM so this means that we no longer have to reserve memory buffers for expansion and uh, we're able to store it in flash. Often most of these boards have uh, external QSPY and uh, and that's that's usually in the eight to 16 megabytes of footprint. So plenty of space um, and it's relatively cheap. So we've got, a, we've got a level of optimization there. So I'm gonna apply that and I'm gonna run that. So what we'll see is that in our projects explorer view, We've exported that header file, the sbenginemodel.h, and we can go and take a look at it, and we can uh, open that as a text file. So we'll be able to see some things immediately. Uh, so here's our model. This has been hex encoded. And if I go to the very end, um, here is what we call the storyboard virtual file system. So we've stored all these assets in hex blob format. Um, so the fonts and everything else, um, stored those uh, in uh, in in the header file format, you can add it to your application. 
Okay, so note we've also got some C callbacks here, which I'll come to in a minute. So that's the uh, the application. We can now go and add that to our uh, our project, um, and we'll be able to build that. So I'm not going to do that at this stage. I'm going to do one level extra of optimization. So that's the the first level uh, where we, we're running with uh, scripts. We're running with uh, callbacks and Lua, which is perfectly perfectly had adequate on uh, on a, a relatively large um, MCU memory footprint. So I think we're predicting something like, I, I should say that the uh, the export uh, prediction does not include um, the size of the uh, frame buffer. So that's a static allocation. So now what we're going to do is uh, see some I'm running on an IMEX RT 1060 using the free RTOS RTOS. So uh, how do we, uh, how do we, take our application and take it to the target. So we, let's look at our uh, storyboard again. Uh, we created the SPNG model. That's now a resource file we're going to use on our target board. That contains all the model and all of the assets. We are now, uh, storyboard is now integrated as an option in um, it directly in the MCU Espresso SDK. So you can add us um, directly from uh, the SDK dashboard. Uh, you can see here that we've made a recipe with the uh, storyboard components there, Crank Storyboard GUI. This, uh, you, you go ahead and download the, uh, the MCU Espresso SDK. And then when you um, import it, you should get three applications uh, for Storyboard and Crank. So uh, here we have our coffee app that we saw earlier. And um, here's our SP Engine model that was exported. So uh, I've gone ahead and, uh, and built that. Uh, what you can see, uh, I've uh, downloaded it and run it already. Um, so in terms of the image, the uh, the the flash is, uh, we're using a little bit of the flash, 21% of the flash. Uh, this particular configuration is configured to run with SDRAM and uh, and the display buffer. You see here, that's the, uh, the two lots of 255 kilobytes of SRAM for the two display buffers. Uh, we could, of course, reconfigure this and run those from internal SRAM. So that's maybe a, an extra step you can do yourself. And that's just a link of file change. So uh, we have and do run entirely on the uh, onboard resources of the uh, SRAM on the uh, 1060. So you know, we have uh, 768K for the, um, the SRAM OC, the on-chip SRAM. So let me hit hit go here and you'll see uh, we, the first thing we do is uh, start one of our two tasks. We have our SP Engine main task uh, and we also have the uh, the storyboard input task we're starting up. Uh, so I'm going to hit run. Once we started up, uh, the uh, standard uh, board initialization has proceeded and now we're ready to uh, to launch the storyboard main task. Uh, here we're breaking to the run. So this is going to kick off loading the model and starting executing the model and the metadata. So the very first thing that happens is we do a call back, a call out uh, from the um, the engine into uh, a degenerate display in it. Uh, and obviously this is a this is a place where you do any personalization, turning on the backlight, uh, setting up any hardware. We're using standard um, standard BSP drivers here, the uh, the parallel LCD interface. But you could be using QSPY or some other other physical interface. Um, so this is called once and once only. Uh, we're also initializing here the uh, the PXP, the uh, the pixel pipeline accelerator, which we'll use to assist in the drawing. Going to hit run, and at this point, uh, I'm going to just uh, switch my camera, so you should be able to see uh, my screen. Okay, so uh, the target board there is uh, is powered up and ready. I'm just uh, at the point now where you can see we're on the breakpoint. Um, which is display update. And this is called each and every time a, a render changes. And obviously this is the first time it's called because it's the uh, it's the first screen in the uh, in the, the application has been drawn. So I'm gonna hit go now and you can see that it's drawing and every time we've got a fade effect on the uh, on the coffee app, it's uh, a little difficult to tell there. We have a, and it's it's gonna be triggering a render every every frame. Okay. So I'm gonna Stop that and restart it again and let it run without any breakpoints. Okay, so now we're just going to restart. We're going to hit the beginning. And I'm going to hit go. Remove the breakpoint there. 
and uh, the display in it and finally the display update and um, we're basically up and running so you can see on the screen uh, hopefully you'll be able to see that um, the uh, there's a pulsing effect and I can transition to other screens we've got some screen transitions effectively it's exactly the same application that we saw running on the uh, on the other the other desktop um, application um, but running on an MCU in this case so uh, this shows you really how easy it is to take an application uh, that was targeting, uh, a, you know, a, maybe a higher power processor. Maybe it's difficult to get those now. Um, and then moving it and migrating it uh, without rewriting anything, uh, migrating that to a MCU target. So uh, it gives you some freedom and some deployment options uh, in these difficult times. So by way of wrap up and a quick summary, um, We've shown how easy it is to develop a user interface with Storyboard and also to uh, get it running on a variety of targets, which gives you flexibility in sourcing and also options for designing your next generation product with a view to scalability in mind. Uh, it's very easy to get onto the target quickly. It's very fast to deploy and to build. Um, and the whole process flow is optimized to help you get your design uh, into a process which is running on the target as fast as possible. So I encourage you to try out Storyboard for free. Uh, we have free trial version available from our website. Uh, this is a full, um, full version. Uh, it's uh, time limited. And there's also a series of uh, examples and other, uh, other good resources on our website, trial video videos and another um, help center items. Okay, so uh, let's take some questions.